Section 35 of the Natural History, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Rutger, July 17, 2021, Westford, Massachusetts. The Natural History, Volume 7, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 35, Book 37, Chapters 11 to 18. Chapter 11, Amber. The many falsehoods that have been told about it. Next in rank among the objects of luxury, we have amber, an article which, for the present, however, is in request among women only. It is of vegetable origin, and according to Gopert, was originally a viscous resin of a tree named by him Penides succinifer. It is used by men more particularly at the present day as a mouthpiece for pipes. All these three last mentioned substances hold the same rank, no doubt as precious stones. The two former for certain fair reasons, crystal because it is adapted for taking cool drinks, and marine vessels for taking drinks that are either hot or cold. But as for amber, luxury has not been able as yet to devise any justification for the use of it. This is a subject which affords us an excellent opportunity of exposing some of the frivolities and falsehoods of the Greeks, and I beg that my readers will only have patience with me while I do so, it being really worth while for our own practical improvement to become acquainted with the marvelous stories which they have promulgated respecting amber. After Phaethon had been struck by lightning, his sisters, they tell us, became changed into poplars, which every year shed their tears upon the banks of the Eridanus, a river known to us as the Padus. To these tears was given the name of Electrum, from the circumstance that the sun was usually called Elector. Such is the story at all events that is told by many of the poets, the first of whom were, in my opinion, Aeschylus, Philoxenus, Euripides, Satyrus, and Nicander and the falsity of which is abundantly proved upon the testimony of Italy itself, where Amor was not to be found. Those among the Greeks who have devoted more attention to the subject have spoken of certain islands in the Adriatic Sea known as Electrides, to which the Padus, they say, carries down the Electrum. It is the fact, however, that there never were any islands there so-called, nor indeed any island so situate as to allow the Padus carrying down anything in its course to their shores. As to Aeschylus placing the Eridanus in Iberia, or, in other words, in Spain, and giving it the name of Rhodanus, and as to Euripides and Apollonius representing the Rhodanus and the Padus as discharging themselves by one common mouth on the shores of the Adriatic, we can forgive them all the more readily for knowing nothing about amber when they betray such monstrous ignorance of geography. Other writers, again, who are more guarded in their assertions, have told us, though with an equal degree of untruthfulness, that at the extremity of the Adriatic Gulf, upon certain inaccessible rocks there, there are certain trees which shed their gum at the rising of the dog star. Theophrastus has stated that amber is extracted from the earth in Liguria chars that Phaethon died in the territory of Haman and Ethiopia, where there is a temple of his to an oracle, and where amber is produced. Philemon that it is a fossil substance, and that it is found in two different localities in Scythia, in one of which is a white and waxen color, and is known as electrum while in the other it is red and is called sualiternicum. Demostratus calls amber lincurian, and he says that it originates from the urine of the wild beast known as the lynx, that voided by the male producing a red and fiery substance, and that by the female an amber of a white and less pronounced color. He also informs us that by some persons it is called a langurium, and that in Italy there are certain wild beasts known as Languri. Xenothemus, however, calls these wild beasts Lange, and gives the banks of the river Padus as their locality. Sudin says that it is a tree, in reality, that produces amber, 
and that in Urcuria, this tree is known by the name of lynx, an opinion which is also adopted by Metrodorus. Sotakis expresses a belief that amber exudes from certain stones in Britannia, to which he gives the name of Electrides. Pythias says that the Gutones, a people of Germany, inhabit the shores of an estuary of the ocean called Mentonamon, their territory extending a distance of 6,000 stadia, that at one day's sail from this territory is the Isle of Abelus, upon the shores of which amber is thrown up by the waves in spring, it being an excretion of the sea in a concrete form, as also that the inhabitants use this amber by way of fuel and sell it to their neighbors, the Tuotones. Timaeus, too, is of the same belief, but he has given to the island the name of Basilia. Philemon says that Electrum did not yield a flame. Nicias, again, will have it that it is a liquid produced by the rays of the sun, and that these rays, at the moment of the sun setting, striking with the greatest force upon the surface of the soil, leave upon it an unctuous sweat, which is carried off by the tides of the ocean and thrown open upon the shores of Germany. He states also that in Egypt it is similarly produced and is there called sakal. In Hebrew, this word means a stone. That it is found in India too, where it is held as a preferable substitute for frankincense, and that in Syria the women make the whorls of their spindles of this substance and give it the name of harpax, from the Greek arpazo, to drag from the circumstance that it attracts leaves toward it, chaff, and the light fringe of tissues. According to Theocristus, amber is thrown up by the tides of the ocean at the foot of the Pyrenean range, an opinion adopted also by Xenocrates. Sarabas, who has written the most recently upon these subjects and is still living, informs us that near the shores of the Atlantic is Lake Cephisus, known to the Maiari by the name of Electrum, and that when this lake is dried up by the sun, the slime of it produces amber, which floats upon the surface. Mencius speaks of a locality in Africa called Sicyon and of a river Krathis there, which discharges itself from a lake into the ocean, the banks of which are frequented by birds, which he calls Melagrides and Penelopes. It is there that, according to him, electrum is produced in manner above mentioned. Theomenes says that near the greater Syrtis are the gardens of the Hesperides, and Lake Electrum on the banks, he says, are poplars, from the summits of which amber falls into the water below, where it is gathered by the maidens of the Hesperides. Stisius asserts that there is in India a river called Hypobaris a word which signifies bearer of all good things, that this river flows from the north into the eastern ocean, where it discharges itself near a mountain covered with trees, which produce electrum, and that these trees are called siptacare, the meaning of which is intense sweetness. Mithritides says that off the shores of Germany there is an island called Sorita, the old reading is Osretica. A Jason identifies it with the island of Ocel in the Baltic. Covered with a kind of cedar, from which amber falls upon the rocks. According to Xenocrates, this substance is called in Italy not only succinum, but theum as well. The Scythian name of it, for there also it is to be found, being Sacrium. Others, he says, are of opinion that it is a product of Numidia. But the one that has surpassed them all is Sophocles, the tragic poet, a thing that indeed surprises me when I only consider the surpassing of his lofty style, the high repute that he enjoyed in his life, his elevated position by birth at Athens, his various exploits, and his high military command. According to him, amber is produced in the countries beyond India from the tears that are shed for Milagre by the birds called Milagrides. Who can be otherwise than surprised that he should have believed such a thing as this, or have hoped to persuade others to believe it? 
What child, too, could possibly be found in such a state of ignorance as to believe that birds weep once a year, that their tears are so prolific as this, or that they go all the way from Greece, where Malagra died, to India to weep? But then, it will be said, do not the poets tell many other stories that are quite as fabulous? Such is the fact, no doubt, but for a person seriously to advance such an absurdity with reference to a thing so common as amber, which is imported every day and so easily proves the mendacity of this assertion, is neither more nor less than to evince a supreme contempt for the opinions of mankind, and to assert with impunity an intolerable falsehood. There can be no doubt that amber is a product of the islands of the northern ocean, and that it is the substance by the Germans called glacium, for which reason the Romans, when Germanicus Caesar commanded the fleet in those parts, gave to one of these islands the name of glissaria, which by the barbarians was known as Australia. Amber is produced from a marrow discharged by trees belonging to the pine genus like gum from the cherry and resin from the ordinary pine. It is a liquid at first, which issues forth in considerable quantities, and is gradually hardened by heat or cold, or else by the action of the sea, when the rise of the tide carries off the fragments from the shores of these islands. At all events, it is thrown up upon the coast in so light and voluble a form that in the shallows it has all the appearance of hang suspended in the water. Our forefathers, too, were of the opinion that it is the juice of a tree, and for this reason gave it the name of succinum, from susius, juice. And one great proof that it is the produce of a tree of the pine genus is the fact that it emits a pine-like smell when rubbed, and that it burns when ignited with the odor and appearance of torch pine wood. Amber is imported by the Germans into Pannonia, more particularly from whence the Veneti, by the Greeks called Eneti, first brought it into general notice. A people in the vicinity of Pannonia and dwelling on the shores of the Adriatic Sea. From this it is evident how the story which connects it with the Padis first originated, and at the present day we see the female peasantry in the countries that lie beyond that river wearing necklaces of amber principally as an ornament, no doubt, but on account of its remedial virtues as well. For amber, it is generally believed, is good for affections of the tonsillary glands and fosses, and the various kinds of water in the vicinity of the Alps being apt to produce disease in the human throat. Goiter, for example, from Conuntum in Pannonia, to the coasts of Germany from which the amber is brought is a distance of about 600 miles, a fact which has been only very recently ascertained, and there is still living a member of the equestrian order who was sent thither by Julianus, the manager of the gladiatorial exhibitions for the Emperor Nero, to procure a supply of this article. Transversing the coasts of that country and visiting the various markets there, he brought back amber in such vast quantities as to admit of the nets, which are used for protecting the podium, the projecting part in the circus or amphitheater next to the arena and immediately in front of the place occupied by the emperor and nobles, against the wild beasts being studded with amber. The arms to the litters, libitina, meaning the litters on which the slain gladiators were carried away from the arena, and all the other apparatus were, on one day, decorated with nothing but amber, a different kind of display being made each day that these spectacles were exhibited. The largest piece of amber that this personage brought to Rome was 13 pounds in weight. That amber is found in India, too, is a fact well ascertained. Archelaus, who reigned over Cappadocia, says that it is brought back from that country in the rough state, and with the fine bark still adhering to it, it being the custom there to polish it by boiling it in the grease of a sucking pig. The one great proof that amber must have been originally in a liquid state is the fact that owing to its transparency certain objects are to be seen within, ants, for example, gnats, and lizards. 
These, no doubt, must have first adhered to it while liquid, and then, upon its hardening, have remained enclosed within. Chapter 12. The Several Kinds of Amber. The Remedies Derived from It. There are several kinds of amber. The white is the one that has the finest odor, which is perceptible on being rubbed. In some cases, the odor of amber is very fine. In others, it is perfectly fetid, though in the latter case, as Adjassin remarks, it is doubtful whether it may be considered to be genuine amber. But neither this nor the wax-colored amber is held in very high esteem. The red amber is more highly valued, and still more when it is transparent, without presenting too brilliant and igneous an appearance. For amber to be of high quality should present a brightness like that of fire, but not flakes resembling those of flame. The most highly esteemed amber is that known as Falernian, from its resemblance to the color of Falernian wine. It is perfectly transparent and has a softened, transparent brightness. Other kinds, again, are valued for their mellowed tints, like the color of boiled honey in appearance. It ought to be known, however, that any color can be imparted to amber that may be desired, it being sometimes stained with kid suet and root of alkanet. Indeed, at the very present day, amber is dyed purple even. When a vivifying heat has been imparted to it by rubbing it between the fingers, amber will attract chaff, dry leaves, and thin bark, just in the same way that the magnet attracts iron. Pieces of amber steeped in oil burn with a more brilliant and more lasting flame than pith of flax. So highly valued is this as an object of luxury that a very diminutive human effigy made of amber has been known to sell at a higher price than living men even in stout and vigorous health. This single ground for censure, however, is far from being sufficient. In Corinthian objects of virtue, it is the copper that recommends them, combined with silver and gold, and in embossed works, it is the skill and genius of the artist that is so highly esteemed. We have already said what it is that recommends vessels of marine and of crystal. Pearls, too, are of use for wearing upon the head and gems upon the fingers. In the case of all other luxuries, in fact, it is either a spirit of ostentation or some utility that has been discovered in them that pleads so strongly in their behalf. But in that of amber we have solely the consciousness that we are enjoying a luxury and nothing more. Domitius Nero, among the other portentous extravagances of his life, bestowed this name upon the ringlets of his wife Popea, and, in certain verses of his, he has even gone so far as to call them Susini. As fine names, too, are never wanting for bodily defects, a third tint has been introduced of late for hair among our ladies under the name of amber color. Amber, however, is not without its utility in a medicinal point of view, though it is not for this reason that the women are so pleased with it. It is beneficial for infants also attached to the body in the form of an amulet, and, according to Calistratus, it is good for any age as a preventative of delirium and as a cure for strangury, either taken in drink or attached as an amulet to the body. This last author, too, has invented a new variety of amber, giving the name of chrysolectrum to an amber of a golden color, and which presents the most beautiful tints in the morning. This last kind attracts flame, too, with the greatest rapidity, and the moment it approaches the fire, it ignites. Worn upon the neck, he says, it is a cure for fevers and other diseases, and, triturated with honey and oil of roses, it is good for maladies of the ears. Beaten up with attic honey, it is good for dimness of sight, and the powder of it, either taken by itself or with gum mastic in water, is remedial for diseases of the stomach. Amber, too, is greatly in request for the imitation of the transparent precious stones, amethystus in particular. For, as already stated, it admits of being dyed of every color. Chapter 13. Lincurium. Two Asserted Remedies. 
the pertinacity that has been displayed by certain authors compels me to speak of lincurion next for even those who maintain that it is not a variety of amber still assure us that it is a precious stone they assert too that it is a product of the urine of the lynx and a kind of earth the animal covering up the urine the moment it has voided it from a jealousy that man should gain possession of it a combination which hardens into stone the color of it they inform us like that of some kinds of amber is of a fiery hue and it admits they say of being engraved they assert too that this substance attracts to itself not only leaves or straws but thin plates of copper even or of iron a story which Theophrastus even believes, on the faith of a certain Diocles. For my own part, I look upon the whole of these statements as untrue, and I do not believe that in our time there has ever been a precious stone seen with such a name as this. I regard to the assertions that have been I regard to the assertions that have been made as to its medicinal properties as equally false to the effect that taken in drink it disperses urinary calculi and that taken in wine or only looked at it is curative of jaundice chapter fourteen the various precious stones classified according to their principal colors we will now proceed to speak of the various kinds of precious stones the existence of which is generally admitted beginning with those which are the most highly esteemed nor shall we content ourselves with doing this only, but with the view of consulting the general welfare of mankind, we shall also refute the infamous lies that have been promulgated by the magicians. For it is with reference to precious stones, more particularly, that they have circulated most of their fabulous stories, stepping under that most alluring guise of ascertaining remedial virtues beyond all bounds and entering the region of the marvelous adamas six varieties of it two remedies the substance that possesses the greatest value not only among the precious stones but of all human possessions is adamas you may here remark that throughout this book in all cases where there is any doubt as the identification of the substance the ancient name is retained hence our words adamant and diamond if pliny means the latter which is doubtful it still maintains the rank here assigned to it the word adamus is supposed to be derived from the greek a privative and the mao to subdue it being supposed to be invincible by fire the diamond is pure carbon crystallized and is thought to have been of vegetable origin dana has the following remarks upon the word adamus this name was applied by the ancients to several minerals differing much in their physical properties a few of these are quartz specular iron ore emery and other substances of rather high degrees of hardness which cannot now be identified it is doubtful whether pliny had any acquaintance with the real diamond system of mineralogy article diamond we may also add from the same authority that the method of polishing diamonds was first discovered in 1456 by louis berquin a citizen of bridges previous to which time the diamond was only known in its native uncut state a mineral which for a long time was known to kings only and to very few of them such was the name given to nodosity of gold sometimes though but rarely found in the mines in close proximity with gold and only there to be found it was thought the ancients supposed that adamas was only to be discovered in the mines of ethiopia between the temple of mercury and the island of mero and they have informed us that it was never larger than a cucumber seed or differing at all from it in color at the present day for the first time there are no less than six different varieties of it recognized the indian adamus is found not in a stratum of gold but in a substance of a kindred nature to crystal which it closely resembles in its transparency and its highly polished hexagular and hexahedral form 
In shape, it is turbinated, running to a point at either extremity, and closely resembling marvelous to think of two cones united at the base. In size, too, it is as large even as a hazelnut. Resembling that of India is the Adamas of Arabia, which is found in a similar bed, but not so large in size. Other varieties have a pallid hue, like that of silver, and are only to be found in the midst of gold of the very finest quality. These stones are tested upon the anvil and will resist the blow to such an extent as to make the iron rebound and the very anvil split asunder. Indeed, its hardness is beyond all expression, while at the same time it quite sets fire at defiance and is incapable of being heated, owing to which indomitable powers it is, that it has received the name which derives from the Greek. One kind, about as large as a grain of millet in size, has been called senkros, and another that is found in the gold mines of Philippi is known as Macedonian Adamas. This last is about as large as a cucumber seed in size. We next come to the Cyprian Adamas, so called from its being found in the Isle of Cyprus. It is of a color somewhat inclining to that of copper, but in reference to its medicinal virtues, of which we shall have to make further mention, it is the most efficacious of them all. Next in succession to this we have siderites, a stone which shines like iron, and is more ponderous than any of the others, but differs in its properties from them all. For it breaks when struck by the hammer, and admits of being perforated by other kinds of adamas, a thing which is the case also with that of Cyprus. In short, these two are degenerate stones, and only bear the name of Adamus for the purpose of enhancing their value. Now, with reference to those affinities and repugnances which exist between certain objects, known to the Greeks as sympathia and antipathia phenomena, to which we have endeavored to draw attention throughout these books, they nowhere manifest themselves with greater distinctness than here. This indomitable power, in fact, which sets at naught the two most violent agents in nature, fire, namely, and iron, is made to yield before the blood of a he-goat. The blood, however, must be no otherwise than fresh and warm. The stone, too, must be well steeped in it, and then subjected to repeated blows, and even then it is apt to break both anvils and hammers of iron, if they are not of the very finest temper. To what spirit of research, or to what accident, are we indebted for this discovery? Or what conjecture can it have been that first led man to experiment on a thing of such extraordinary value as this, and that, too, with the most unclean of all animals? Surely a discovery such as this must have been due solely to the munificence of the gods, and we must look for the reason of it in none of the elementary operations of nature, but wholly in her will. When, by good fortune, this stone does happen to be broken, it divides into fragments so minute as to be almost imperceptible. These particles are held in great request by engravers, who enclose them in iron and are enabled thereby with the greatest facility to cut the very hardest substances known. So great is the antipathy borne by this stone to the magnet, that when placed near it will not allow of its attracting iron, or if the magnet has already attracted the iron, it will seize the metal and drag it away from the other. Adamus, too, overcomes and neutralizes poisons, dispels delirium, and banishes groundless perturbations of the mind. Hence it is that some have given it the name of Anankites. Metrodorus of Sepsis is the only author that I know of who says that this stone is found also in Germany, and in the island of Basilia where amber is found. He says, too, that this is preferable to the stone of Arabia. But can there be any doubt that his statement is incorrect? Chapter 16. Smaragdus. Next in esteem with us are the pearls of India and Arabia, of which we have already spoken in the ninth book, when treating of the marine productions. 
The third rank, for many reasons, has been given to the smaragdus. Indeed, there is no stone, the color of which is more delightful to the eye, for whereas the sight fixes itself with avidity upon the green grass and the foliage of the trees, we have all the more pleasure in looking upon the smaragdus, there being no green in existence of a more intense color. The emerald is supposed to derive this color from a minute portion of oxide of chrome. And then, besides, of all the precious stones, this is the only one that feeds the sight without satiating it. Even when the vision has been fatigued with intently viewing other objects, it is refreshed by being turned upon this stone, and lapidaries know nothing that is more gratefully soothing to the eyes its soft green tints being wonderfully adapted for assuaging lassitude when felt in those organs and then besides when viewed from a distance these stones appear all the larger to the sight reflecting as they do their green hues upon the circumambient air neither sunshine shade nor artificial light affects any change in their appearance they have always a softened and graduated brilliancy, and transmitting the light with facility, they allow the vision to penetrate their interior, property which is so pleasing also with reference to water. In form they are most concave so as to reunite the rays of light and the powers of vision, and hence it is that it is so universally agreed upon among mankind to respect these stones and to forbid their surface to be engraved. In the case, however, of the stones of Scythia and Egypt, their hardness is such that it would be quite impossible to penetrate them. When the surface of the smaragdus is flat, it reflects the image of objects in the same manner as a mirror. The Emperor Nero used to view the combats of the gladiators upon a smaragdus. Chapter 17. Twelve Varieties of the Smaragdus of this stone there are no less than twelve different kinds, of which the finest is the Scythian smaragdus, so called from the country where it is found. None of them has a deeper color than this, or is more free from defects. Indeed, in the same degree that the smaragdus is superior to other precious stones, the Scythian smaragdus is superior to the other varieties. Next in esteem to this, as also in locality, is the smaragdus of Bactriana. These stones are collected, it is said, in the fissures of rocks when the Etesian winds prevail, a period at which the earth that covers them is removed, and the stones are detected by their brightness, the sands being greatly agitated by the action of the winds. These last, however, are much inferior, they say, to those of Scythia in size. The third rank is held by the stones of Egypt, which are extracted from the hills in the vicinity of Coptus, a city of Thebes. Mount Zalora in Upper Egypt still produces emeralds and was probably the only locality of the genuine stone that was known to the ancients. All the other kinds are found in copper mines, and hence it is that of these varieties the smaragdus of Cyprus holds the highest rank. The merit of them consists in their clear color, which has nothing thin or diluted in it, but presents a rich and humid transparency, closely resembling the tints of the sea, in fact. Hence, it is that these stones are at once diaphanous and shining, or, in other words, reflect their colors and allow the vision to penetrate within. They say that in this island, upon the tomb of a petty king named Hermias, near the fisheries, Cetarias, there, there was formerly a lion in marble, with eyes made of smaragdi, the brilliance of which penetrated the sea to such a degree as to alarm the Tunis and put them to flight, a novel circumstance which for a long time excited the wonder in fishermen till at last the stones in the statue were changed for others. Chapter 18. Defects in the Smaragdus It will be only proper to, seeing that the prices of these stones are so exorbitant, to point out their defects. Some defects, no doubt, are common to all of them, 
while others again, like those found in the human race, are peculiar only to those of a certain country. Thus, for example, the stones of Cyprus are not all green alike. And in the same Smaragdus, some parts are more or less so than others, the stone not always preserving that uniform deep tint which characterizes the Smaragdus of Scythia. In other instances, a shadow runs through the stone, and the color becomes dulled thereby, the consequence of which is that its value is depreciated, and even more so when the color is thin and diluted. In consequence of the defects of these stones, they have been divided into several classes. Some of them are obscure and are known as blind stones. Some have a certain density which impairs their transparency. Others, again, are mottled and others covered with a cloud. This cloud, however, is altogether different from the shadow above mentioned for it is a defect which renders the stone of a whitish hue and not of a transparent green throughout, presenting as it does in the interior or upon the surface a certain degree of whiteness which arrests the vision. Other defects again in these stones are filaments, salt-like grains, or traces of lead ore, faults which are mostly common to them all. Next, after the kinds above described, the Smaragdus of Ethiopia is held in high esteem, being found, as Juba tells us, at a distance of 25 days' journey from the Coptus. These are of a bright green, but are seldom to be met with perfectly clear or of an uniform color. Democritus includes in this class of stones that are known as Hermene and as Persian stones, the former of which are of a convex, massive shape, while the latter are destitute of transparency, but have an agreeable, uniform color, and satisfy the vision without allowing it to penetrate them, strongly resembling in this respect the eyes of cats and of panthers, which are radiant without being diaphanous. In the sun, he says, they lose their brilliancy, but they are radiant in the shade, the brightness of them being seen at a greater distance than in the case of other stones. One other fault, too, in all these stones is that they often have a color like that of honey or rancid oil, or else are clear and transparent, but not green. These defects exist in the Smaragdi of Attica, more particularly which are found in the silver mines there at a place known by the name of Thorikos. These last are never so massive as the others, and are always more pleasing to the sight when viewed from a distance. Lead ore, too, is often to be detected in them, or, in other words, they have a leaden appearance when looked at in the sun. One peculiarity in them is that some of them become impaired by age, gradually lose their green color, and are even deteriorated by exposure to the sun. Next to the stones of Attica come those of Medea, a variety which presents the most numerous tints of all, and sometimes approaches Sapphiros in color. These stones are wavy and represent various natural objects, such as poppy heads, for example, birds, the young of animals, and feathers. All of them appear naturally of a green color, but become improved by the application of oil. No stones of this species are of a larger size than these. I am not aware that any of these stones are still in existence in Chalcedon, the copper mines of that locality being now exhausted. But be this as it may, they were always the smallest in size and the most inferior in value. Brittle and of a color far from distinctly pronounced, they resembled in their tints the feathers that are seen in the tail of the peacock or on the necks of pigeons. More or less brilliant, too, according to the angle at which they were viewed, they presented an appearance like that of veins and scales. There was another defect also peculiar to these stones known as sarcion from the circumstance that a kind of flesh appeared to attach itself to the stone. The mountain near Chalcedon, 
where these stones were gathered is still known by the name of smaragdites. Juba informs us that a kind of smaragdus known as chloras is used in Arabia as an ornament for buildings and also the stone by which the people of Egypt is called alabastritis. On the same authority, too, we learn that there are several varieties of smaragdus in the neighboring mountains and that stones like those of Medea are found in Mount Tegetis, as also in Sicily. End of section 35. Section 36 of the Natural History, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Rucker, August 22, 2021, Westford, Massachusetts. The Natural History, Volume 7, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 36, Book 37, Chapters 19 to 30. Chapter 19, The Precious Stone Called Thanos, Chalcos Maragdos. Among the Smaragdi is also included the precious stone known as Thanos. It comes from Persia and is of an unsightly green and of a soiled color within. There is the Chalcos Maragdos, it was probably dioptase combined with copper pyrites, also a native of Cyprus, the face of which is mottled with coppery veins. Theophrastus relates that he had found it stated in the Egyptian histories that a king of Babylon once sent to the king of Egypt a smaragdus four cubits in length by three in breadth. He informs us also that in a temple of Jupiter in Egypt, there was an obelisk made of four smaragdi, forty cubits in length and four in breadth at one extremity and two at the other. He says, too, that at the period at which he wrote, there was in the temple of Hercules at Tyrus a large column made of singular smaragdus, though very possibly it might only be a pseudo-smaragdus, a kind of stone not uncommonly found in Cyprus where a block had been discovered, composed one half of smaragdus and one half of jasper, and the liquid in which had not as yet been entirely transformed. Appion, surnamed Plistonices, meaning the conqueror of many, has left a very recent statement that there was still in existence in his time in the labyrinth of Egypt a colossal statue of Serapis, made of a single smaragdus, nine cubits in height. Chapter 20. Barrels. Eight varieties of them, defects in barrels. Barrels, it is thought, are of the same nature as the smaragdus, or at least closely analogous. India produces them, and they are rarely to be found elsewhere. The lapidaries cut all barrels of an hexagonal form because the color, which is deadened by a dull uniformity of surface, is heightened by the reflection resulting from the angles. If they are cut in any other way, these stones have no brilliancy whatever. The most esteemed barrels are those which in color resemble the pure green of the sea, the chryso barrel being next in value, a stone of a somewhat paler color, but approaching a golden tint. Closely allied to this last in its brilliancy, but of a more pallid color, and thought by some to constitute a separate genus, is chrysoprasus, leek green and gold. In the fourth rank are reckoned the hyacinthine barrels, and in the fifth, those known as aoroides, sky colored. Next, we have the wax colored barrels, and after them, the oleaginous barrels, so called from the resemblance of their color to that of oil. Last of all, there are the stones, which closely resemble crystal in appearance, mostly disfigured by spots and filaments, and of a poor faint color as well, all of them so many imperfections in the stone. The people of India are marvelously fond of barrels of an elongated form and say that these are the only precious stones they prefer wearing without the addition of gold. Hence, it is that after piercing them, 
they string them upon the bristles of the elephant. It is generally agreed, however, that those stones should not be perforated which are of the finest quality, and in this case they only enclose the extremities of them in studs of gold. They prefer to cutting the barrels in a cylindrical form instead of setting them as precious stones, an elongated shape being the one that is most highly esteemed. Some are of the opinion that barrels are naturally angular and that when pierced they become improved in color, the white substance being thus removed that lies within and their brilliancy heightened by the reflection of the gold in which they are set, or at all events their transparency being increased by this diminution in their thickness. In addition to the defects already mentioned, and which are pretty nearly the same as those to which the smaragdus is subject, barrels are affected with cloudy spots, like those on the fingernails in appearance. In our own part of the world, it is thought that they are sometimes found in countries that lie in the vicinity of Pontus. The people of India, by coloring crystal, have found a method of imitating various precious stones, barrels in particular. Chapter 21. Opals. Seven varieties of them. Opals are at once very similar to and very different from barrels and only yield to the smaragdus in value. India too is the sole parent of these precious stones, thus completing her glory as being the great producer of the most costly gems. Of all precious stones, it is opal that presents the greatest difficulties of description it displaying at once the piercing fire of carbunculus, the purple brilliancy of amethystus, and the sea-green of smaragdus, the whole blended together and refulgent with a brightness that is quite incredible. Some authors have compared the effect of its refulgeny to that of the color known as Armenian pigment while others speak of it as resembling the flame of burning sulfur, or a flame fed with oil. In size, the opal is about as large as a hazelnut, and with reference to it, there is a remarkable historical anecdote related. For there is still in existence a stone of this class, on account of which Antonius proscribed the senator Nonius, son of the Nonius Struma, whom the poet Catullus was so displeased at seeing in the Ciro chair, and grandfather of the Servilius Nonianus, who in our own times was consul. On being thus proscribed, Nonius took to flight, carrying with him out of all his wealth nothing but this ring, the value of which it is well known was estimated at two millions of sesterces. How marvelous must have been the cruelty, how marvelous the luxurious passion of Antonius, thus to prescribe a man for the possession of a jewel, and no less marvelous must have been the obstinacy of Nonius, who could thus dote upon what had been the cause of his proscription. For we see the very brutes even tear off the portion of their body, for the sake of which they know their existence to be imperiled, and so redeem themselves by parting with it. Chapter 22. Defects in Opals. The Modes of Testing Them. Defects in Opal are a color inclining to that of the flower called heliotropium, or to that of crystal or of hailstones, salt-like grains intervening, roughness on the surface, or sharp points presenting themselves to the eye. There is no stone that is imitated by fraudulent dealers with more exactness than this in glass, the only mode of detecting the imposition being by the light of the sun. For when a false opal is held between the finger and thumb and exposed to the rays of that luminary, it presents but one and the same transparent color throughout, limited to the body of the stone whereas the genuine opal offers various refulgent tints in succession and reflects now one hue and now another as it sheds its luminous brilliancy upon the fingers. This stone, in consequence of its extraordinary beauty, has been called Paeduros, lovely youth, by many authors, and some who make a distinct species of it say that it is the same as the stone that in India is called Sanjinan, 
These last mentioned stones, it is said, are found in Egypt also, Arabia, and of very inferior quality in Pontus. Galatia, too, is said to produce them, as also Thassus and Cyprus. The finest in quality of them have all the beauty of opal, but they are of a softer brilliance and are mostly rough on the surface. Their color is a mixture of sky blue and purple, and the green hues of the smaragdus are wanting. Those, too, are preferred which have their brilliancy deepened by a venous hue, rather than those which have their colors diluted, as it were, with water. Chapter 23. Sardonic. The several varieties of it. Defects in the sardonic. Thus far we have spoken in reference to the stones, which it is generally agreed belong to the highest rank in obedience, more particularly to a degree that has been passed by the ladies to that effect. There is less certainty with respect to those upon which the men as well have been left to form a judgment, seeing that the value of each stone depends more particularly upon the caprice of the individual and the rivalry that exists in reference thereto. As, for example, when Claudius Caesar was so much in the habit of wearing the Smaragdus and the Sardonyx. The first Roman who wore Sardonyx, according to Demostratus, was the elder Africanus, since whose time this stone has been held in very high esteem at Rome, for which reason we shall give it the next place after the opal. By Sardonyx, from the Greek Sarmaton, Sard, and onyx a fingernail as the name itself indicates was formerly understood a sarda with a white ground beneath it like the flesh beneath the human fingernail both parts of the stone being equally transparent such according to ismenius demostratus xenothenus and sotakis is the sardonyx of india the last two giving the name of blind sardonyx to all the other stones of this class which are not transparent and which have now entirely appropriated the name to themselves for at the present day the arabian sardonyx presents no traces whatever of the indian sarda it being a stone that has been found to be characterized by several different colors of late black or azure for the base, and vermilion surrounded with a line of rich white for the upper part, not without a certain glimpse of purple as the white passes into the red. We learn from Xenothemis that in his time these stones were not held by the people of India in any high esteem, although they are found there of so large a size as to admit of the hilts of swords being made of them. It is well known, too, that in that country they are exposed to view by the mountain streams, and that in our part of the world they were formerly valued from the fact that they are nearly the only ones among the engraved precious stones that do not bring away the wax when an impression is made. The consequence is that our example has at last taught the people of India to set a value upon them and the lower classes there now pierce them even to wear them as ornaments for the neck. A great proof, in fact, at the present day, of a sardonyx being of Indian origin. Those of Arabia are remarkable for their marginal line of brilliant white, of considerable breadth, and not glistening in hollow fissures in the stone or upon the sides, but shining upon the very surface at the margin and supported by a ground intensely black beneath. In the stones of India, this ground is like wax in color, or else like cornell, with a circle also of white around it. In some of these stones, too, there is a play of colors like those of the rainbow, while the surface is redder even than the shell of the sea locust. Those stones, which are like honey in appearance, or of a faeculent color, such being the name given to one defect in them, are generally disapproved of. They are rejected also when the white zone blends itself with the other colors, and its limits are not definitely marked, or, if in like manner, it is irregularly intersected by any other color, it being looked upon as an imperfection if the regularity of any one of the colors is interrupted by the interposition of another. 
The sardonyx of Armenia is held in some esteem, but the zone round it is of a pallid hue. But the zone round it is of a pallid hue. Chapter 24. Onyx. The several varieties of it. We must give some account also of onyx, because of the name which it partly shares in common with sardonyx. This name, though in some places given to a marble, is here used to signify a precious stone. Sudin says that in this stone there is a white portion which resembles the white of the human fingernail, in addition to the colors of chrysolithos, sarda, and iaspis. According to Xenothemis, there are numerous varieties of the Indian onyx, the fiery colored, the black, and the cornel, with white veins encircling them like an eye, as it were, and in some cases running across them obliquely. It is pretty clear that the onyx of Pliny included not only our onyx, but several other varieties of the Chalcedony. Sotakis mentions an Arabian onyx, which differs from the rest, that of India, according to him, presenting small flames, each surrounded by one or more white zones, in a manner altogether different from the Indian sardonyx, which presents a series of white specks, while in this case it is one continuous circle. The Arabian onyx, on the other hand, is black, he says, with a white zone encircling it. Satiris says that there is an onyx in India of a flesh color, partly resembling carbunculus and partly chrysolithos and amethystus, a variety, however, which he altogether disapproves of. The real onyx, according to him, has numerous veins of variegated colors interspersed with others of a milk-white hue the shades of which, as they pass into one another, produce a tint which surpasses all description and blends itself into one harmonious whole of a most beautiful appearance. Not unlike sardonyx, too, is sarda, a stone which also has, in part, a kindred name with it. But before passing on to it, we must first take some notice of all those precious stones which have a brilliancy like that of flame. Chapter 25 Carbunculus, 12 varieties of it. In the first rank among these is carbunculus, literally meaning a red hot coal, so called from its resemblance to fire, though in reality it is proof against the action of that element. Hence it is that some persons call these stones acostoi, from the Greek meaning incombustible. There are various kinds of carbunculus, the Indian and the Garamantic, for example, which last has been also called the Carchidonian, in complement to the former opulence of the great Carthage. To these are added the Ethiopian and the Alabantic stones, the latter of which are found at Arthosia in Caria, but are cut and polished at Alabanda. In addition to this, each kind is subdivided into the male carbunculus and the female, the former of which is a more striking brilliancy, the brightness of the latter being not so strong. In the male varieties, too, we see some in which the fire is clearer than in others, while some, again, are of a darker hue, or else have their brilliancy more deeply seated, and shine with a more powerful luster than others when viewed in the sun. The most highly esteemed, however, is the amethyst-colored stone, the fire at the extremity of which closely approaches the violent tint of amethystus, next in value to which are the stones known as sertites, radiant with the wavy, feathery refulgeny. They are found more particularly, it is said, where the reflection is most powerful of the rays of the sun. Satiris says that carbunculus of India has no luster, that it is mostly soiled, and that in all cases its brilliancy is of a tawny complexion. The Ethiopian stones, he says, are dense, emit no luster, and burn with a concentrated flame. According to Callistratus, the refulgeny of this stone should be of a whitish hue, and when placed upon a table, it should heighten by its luster other stones placed near it that are clouded at the edge. Hence it is that many writers speak of this stone as the white carbunculus, 
while the Indian stone, with its comparatively feeble luster, is known by the name of lignizon. The Carchedonian stones, they say, are of a much smaller size than the others, but those of India admit of being hollowed out and making vessels that will hold as much as one sextarius even. According to Archelaus, the Carchedonian carbunculus is of a more swarthy appearance than the others, but when exposed to the light of the fire or sun and viewed obliquely, the brilliancy of it is much more intense than that of the rest. He says, too, that this stone, when overshadowed by a roof, has a purple tint, that when viewed in the open air is of a flame color, and that, when exposed to the rays of the sun, it scintillates. He states also that wax, if sealed with these stones, in the shade even, will melt. Many others have asserted that the Indian stones are paler than the Carchedonian, and that, quite the converse of these last, they are all the less brilliant when viewed obliquely, as also that in the male Carchedonian stone there are luminous points like stars within, while, in the case of the female stone, the whole of its refulgeny is thrown beyond it. The stones of Alabanda, too, it is said, are darker than the other kinds and rough on the surface. In the vicinity also of Miletus, there are stones of this description found in the earth, resembling those of Alabanda in color and proof against the action of fire. According to Theophrastus, these stones are to be found also at Orchomenus in Arcadia and in the Isle of Chios, the former of which are of a darker hue and are used for making mirrors. He says, too, that at Troezen they are found of various colors and mottled with white spots, those found at Corinth being of a more pallid, whitish hue. He states also that they are sometimes imported from Massilia. Focus informs us in his writings that these stones are extracted from the ground at Elisipo at the cost of great labor. However, in consequence of the parched, argillaceous nature of the soil. Chapter 26, Defects in Carbunculus and the Mode of Testing It. Nothing is more difficult than to distinguish the several varieties of the stone, so great an opportunity do they afford to the artistic skill of compelling them to reflect the colors of substances placed beneath. It is possible, they say, to heighten the brilliancy of dull stones by steeping them for 14 days in vinegar, this adventitious luster being retained by them as many months. They are counterfeited, too, with great exactness in glass, but the difference may be detected with, with the touchstone, the same being the case also with other artificial stones, as the material is always of a softer nature and comparatively brittle. When thus tested by the stone, hard knots, too, are detected in them, and the weight of the glass counterfeit is always less. In some cases, too, they present small blisters within, which shine like silver. Chapter 27. Anthracitis. There is also a fossil stone found in Thesprotia, known as anthracitis, and resembling a burning coal in appearance. Those who have stated that it is a native also of Liguria are mistaken, in my opinion, unless perhaps it was to be found there in their time. Some of these stones, they say, are surrounded with a vein of white, like those which we have mentioned above. They have a fiery color, but there is this peculiarity in them that when thrown into the fire, they will have all the appearance of becoming quenched and deadened, while on the other hand, if they are drenched with water, they become doubly glowing. Chapter 28 Sandastros, Sandaresos. Of a kindred nature, too, is Sandastros, known as Garmantites by some. It is found in India at a place of that name and is a product also of the southern parts of Arabia. The great recommendation of it is that it has all the appearance of fire placed behind a transparent substance, it burning with star-like scintillations within that resemble drops of gold and are always to be seen in the body of the stone, and never upon its surface. There are certain religious associations, too, connected with this stone, in consequence of the affinity which it is supposed to bear with the stars, the scintillations being mostly in number and arrangement, like the constellations of the Pleiades and Hyades. 
a circumstance which had led to the use of it by Chaldai in the ceremonials which they practice. Here, too, the male stones are distinguished from the female by the comparative depth of color and the vigorousness of the tints which they impart to objects near them. Indeed, the stones of India, it is said, quite dim the sight by their brilliancy. The flame of the female sandastros is of a more softened nature and may be pronounced to be lustrous rather than brilliant. Some prefer the stone of Arabia to that of India, and say that this last bears a considerable resemblance to a smoke-colored chrysolithos. Ismenius asserts that Sandastris, in consequence of its extreme softness, will not admit of being polished, a circumstance which makes it sell all the dearer. Other writers, again, call these stones Sandricite. One point upon which all the authorities are agreed is that the greater the number of stars upon the stone, the more costly it is in price. The similarity of the name has sometimes caused this stone to be confounded with that known as Sandaresos, and which Nicander calls Sandesarian and others Sandeseron. Some again call this last mentioned stone Sandastros and the former one Sandaresos. The stone that is thus mentioned by Nicander is a native of India as well as the other and likewise takes its name from the locality where it is found. The color of it is that of an apple or of green oil and no one sets any value on it. Chapter 29. Lightness. Four varieties of it. To the same class of flame-colored stones belongs that known as lightness from Leichnos, a lighted lamp or torch, so called from its luster being heightened by the light of the lamp, under which circumstances its tints are particularly pleasing. It is found in the vicinity of Orthosia, throughout the whole of Caria, and in the neighboring localities, but the most approved stones are those that come from India. Some writers have given the name of deadened carbunculus to a likeness of second-rate quality, and similar in color to the flower known as the flower of Jove. I find other varieties also mentioned, one with a purple radiance and another of a scarlet tint. It is asserted, too, that these stones, when heated or rubbed between the fingers, will attract chaff and filaments of paper. Chapter 30. Carchidonia. Carchidonia, too, is said to have the same property, though far inferior in value to the stones already mentioned. It is found in the mountains among the Nasamones, being produced, the natives think, by showers sent for the purpose from heaven. These stones are found by the light of the moon, more particularly when at full. In former days, Carthage was not the entrepot for them. Archelaus speaks of a brittle variety being found in the vicinity of Thebes also, in Egypt, full of veins and similar to dying embers in appearance. I find it stated, too, that in former times drinking vessels used to be made of the stone and of likeness. All these kinds of stone, however, offer the most obstinate resistance to the graveur, and, if used for seals, are apt to bring away a part of the wax. End of section 36. Section 37 of the Natural History, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Rucker, September 9th, 2021, Westford, Massachusetts. The Natural History, Volume 7, by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 37, Book 37, Chapters 31 to 50. Chapter 31, Sarda, Five Varieties of It. Sarda, on the other hand, is remarkably useful for this purpose. A stone which shares its name in part with sardonyx. It is a common stone and was first found at Sardes, but the most esteemed kind is that of the vicinity of Babylon. When certain quarries are being worked, these stones are found adhering, like a kind of heart, to the interior of the rock. 
This mineral, however, is said to be now extinct in Persia, though it is to be found in numerous other localities, Paros and Assos, for example. In India, there are three varieties of this stone, the red sarda, the one known as peonia, from its thickness, and a third kind, beneath which they place a ground of silver tinsel. The Indian stones are transparent, those of Arabia being more opaque. There are some found also in the vicinity of Leucas, in Empiris, and in Egypt, which have a ground placed beneath them of leaf gold. In the case of this stone, too, the male stone shines with a more attractive brilliancy than the female, which is of a thicker substance and more opaque. Among the ancients, there was no precious stone in more common use than this. At all events, it is this stone that is made so much parade of in the comedies of Menander and Philemon. No one, too, among the transparent stones is tarnished more speedily by exposure to moisture than this though of all liquids, it is oil that acts the most readily upon it. Those stones which are like honey in color are generally disapproved of, and still more so when they have the complexion of earthenware. Chapter 32. Topazos, two varieties of it. Topazos is a stone that is still held in very high estimation for its green tints. Indeed, when it was first discovered, it was preferred to every other kind of precious stone. It so happened that some troglodytic pirates, suffering from tempest and hunger, having landed upon an island off the coast of Arabia known as Cytus, when digging there for roots and grass, discovered this precious stone. Such, at least, is the opinion expressed by Archelaus. Juba says that there is an island in the Red Sea called Topazos, at a distance of 300 studia from the mainland that it is surrounded by fogs and is often sought by navigators in consequence, and that owing to this, it received its present name, the word tapazin, meaning to seek in the language of the troglite. He states also that Philon, the king's prefect, was the first to bring these stones from this island, that on his presenting them to Queen Berenice, the mother of the second Ptolemaeus, she was wonderfully pleased with them, and that, at a latter period, a statue four cubits in height was made of this stone in honor of Arsinoe, the wife of Ptolemaeus Philadelphus, it being consecrated in the temple known as the Golden Temple. The most recent writers say that this stone is found also in the vicinity of Alabastrum, a city of Thebes, and they distinguish two varieties of it, the Prasoides, and the chrysopteron, which last is similar to chrysoprasus, all the shades of it tending, more or less, to resemble the coloring principle of the leek. Topazus is the largest of all the precious stones, and is the only one among those of high value that yields to the action of the file, the rest being polished by the aid of stone of Naxos. It admits, too, of being worn by use. Chapter 33. Kalena. With this stone, we must also couple another, which resembles it more closely in appearance than in value, the stone known as Kalena, and of a pale green color. It is found in the countries that lie at the back of India, among the Phaikari, namely, who inhabit Mount Caucasus, the Sake, and the Dahe. It is remarkable for its size, but is covered with holes and full of extraneous matter, that however which is found in Carmania is of a finer quality and far superior. In both cases, however, it is only amid frozen and inaccessible rocks that it is found protruding from the surface, like an eye in appearance and slightly adhering to the rock not as though it formed an integral part of it, but with all the appearance of having been attached to it. People so habituated as they are to riding on horseback cannot find the energy and dexterity requisite for climbing the rocks to obtain the stones, while, at the same time, they are quite terrified at the danger of doing so. Hence it is that they attack the stones with slings from a distance, and so bring them down, moss and all. 
It is with this stone that the people pay their tribute, and this the rich look upon as their most graceful ornament for the neck. It constitutes the whole of their wealth with some, and it is their chief glory to recount how many of these stones they have brought down from the mountain heights since the days of their childhood. Their success, however, is extremely variable, for while some, at the very first throw, have brought down remarkably fine specimens, many have arrived at old age without obtaining any. Such is the method of procuring these stones, their form being given them by cutting, a thing that is easily effected. The best of them have just the color of smaragdus, a thing that proves that the most pleasing property in them is one that belongs of right to another stone. Their beauty is heightened by setting them in gold, and there is no stone to which the contrast of the gold is more becoming. The finest of them lose their color by coming into contact with oil, unguents, or undiluted wine even, whereas those of a poorer quality preserve their color better. There is no stone, too, that is more easily counterfeited in glass. Some writers say that this stone is to be found in Arabia also, in the nest of a bird known as the Melaniorophis. Chapter 34. Prosius, three varieties of it. There are numerous other kinds also of green stones. To the more common class belongs Prosius, one variety of which is disfigured with spots like blood, while another kind is marked with three streaks of white. To all these stones, chrysopressus is preferred, which is also similar to the coloring matter of the leek, but varies in tint between topazes and gold. This stone is found of so large a size as to admit of drinking boats even being made of it, and is cut into cylinders very frequently. Chapter 35. Nilion. India, which produces these stones, produced nilion, also a stone that differs from the last in its dull diminished luster, which when steadily looked upon soon fades from sight. Sudines says that it is to be found also in the Siberus, a river of Attica. In appearance, it resembles a smoke-colored tapazos, or in some cases, a tapazos with a tint like honey. According to Juba, Ethiopia produces it upon the shores of the river known to us as the Nilus, to which circumstance he says it owes its name. Chapter 36. Molochitis Molochitis is not transparent, being of a deeper green and more opaque than smaragdus. Its name is derived from the mallow, which it resembles in color. It is highly esteemed for making seals, and it is endowed by nature with medicinal properties, which render it a preservative for infants against certain dangers which menace them. This stone is a native of Arabia. Chapter 37 Iaspis, 14 varieties of it. Defects found in Iaspis. Iaspis, too, is green and often transparent, a stone which, if surpassed by many others, still retains the renown which it acquired in former times. Many countries produce this stone, that of India is like smaragdus in color, that of Cyprus is hard and of a full sea green, and that of Persia is sky blue, whence its name Erizusa. Similar to this last is the Caspian Iaspis. On the banks of the river Thermodon, the Iaspis is of an azure color. In the Phrygia it is purple, and in Cappadocia of an azure purple, somber and not refulgent. Emesus sends us an Iaspis like that of India in color, and Chalcedon, a stone of a turbid hue but it is of less consequence to distinguish the several localities that furnish it than it is to remark upon the degrees of excellence which they present. The best kind is that which has a shade of purple, the next best being the rose-colored, and the next the stone with the green color of the smaragdus, to each of which the Greeks have given names according to their respective tints. A fourth kind, which is called by them borea, resembles in color the sky of a morning in autumn. This, too, will be the same that is known as Aerzusa. 
There is an iaspis, also which resembles sarda in appearance, and another with a violent tint. Not the less numerous, too, are the other kinds that are left undescribed, but they are all blue to a fault, or else resemble crystal in appearance, or the tints of the mixa plum. There is the terebenthine colored iaspis also, improperly so called in my opinion, as it has all the appearance of being a composition of numerous gems of this description. The best of these stones are set in an open bezel, the gold of which only embraces the margins of the stone, leaving the upper and lower surfaces uncovered. One great defect in them is a subdued luster and a want of refulgence when viewed from a distance. Rains, also like salt, appear within the stone and all the other defects which are common to precious stones in general. Sometimes they are imitated in glass, a fraud, however, which may be easily detected from the material throwing out its refulgence instead of concentrating it within itself. To this class also belongs the stone called sphragis, which is only reckoned as belonging to the domain of precious stones from the circumstance that it is the best of all for making signets. Throughout all the East, it is custom, it is said, to wear iaspis by the way of amulet. The variety of this stone, which resembles smaragdus in color, is often found with a white line running transversely through the middle, in which case it is known as monogramos. When it is streaked with several lines, it is called polygramos. Here, too, I may take the opportunity of exposing the falsehoods of the magicians who pretend that this stone is beneficial for persons when speaking in public. There is a stone also that is formed of iaspis and onyx combined and is known as iasponyx. Sometimes this stone has a clouded appearance, sometimes it has spots upon the surface like snow, and sometimes it is stellated with red spots. One kind resembles salt of Magara in appearance, and another is known as Capneas, and looks as if it had been smoked. We have seen in our day an aspis 15 inches in length, which a figure of Nero was made armed with a caress. Chapter 38. Cyanos, the several varieties of it. We must also give a separate account of cyanos, a name which until very recently was given to a species of iaspis on account of its cerulean color. The best kind is that of Scythia, the next best being the produce of Cyprus, and last of all that of Egypt. An artificial kind is much in use that is prepared by dyeing other substances, and this invention is looked upon as one of the great glories of the kings of Egypt, the name of the king who first discovered it being still preserved in their annals. This stone, too, is divided into male and female, and sometimes it has the appearance of being powdered with a golden dust, in much the same way as Sapphiros. Chapter 39, Sapphiros. For Sapphiros, too, is refulgent with spots like gold. It is also of an azure color, though sometimes, but rarely, it is purple, the best kind being that which comes from Medea. In no case, however, is this stone diaphanous, in addition to which it is not suited for engraving when intersected with hard particles of a crystalline nature. Those among them who have the color of cyanus are generally thought to be the male stones. Chapter 40. Amethystus four varieties of it, Socondion, Sapanos, Farnitis, Aphrodites, Blepharon, Anteros, or Pederos. We will now commence with another class of precious stones, those of a purple color, or whose tints are derived from purple. To the first rank belongs the Amethystus of India, a stone which is also found in the part of Arabia that adjoins Syria and is known as Petra, as also in Lesser Armenia, Egypt, and Galatia. The very worst of all, and the least valued, being those of Thassos and Cyprus. The name which these stones bear originates, it is said, in the peculiar tint of their brilliancy, which, after closely approaching the color of wine, 
passes off into a violet without being fully pronounced, or else, according to some authorities, in the fact that in their purple color there is something that falls short of a fiery color, the tints fading off and inclining to the color of wine. All these stones are transparent and of an agreeable violet color and are easy to engrave. Those of India have in perfection the very richest shades of purple, and it is to attain this color that the dyers in purple direct all their endeavors. In presenting a fine, mellowed appearance to the eye, and not dazzling the sight, as in the case with the colors of the carbunculus. Another variety approaches more nearly the hyacinth color. The people of India call this tint sokon, and the stone itself sokondian. A third stone of this class is of a more diluted color and is known as sapinos, being identical with pharanitis, so called from a country on the frontiers of Arabia that produces it. Of a fourth kind, the color is like that of wine, and in a fifth, it borders very closely upon that of crystal, the purple gradually passing off into white. This last kind is but little valued, for a fine amethyst should always have, when viewed sideways and held up to the light, a certain purple refulgence, like that of carbunculus, slightly inclining to a tint of rose. Some prefer giving these stones the name of Paederos or of Anteros, while to many they are known as Venus's eyelid, a name which would seem to be particularly appropriate to the color and general appearance of the gem. The falsehoods of the magicians would persuade us that these stones are preventative of inebriety, and that it is from this that they have derived their name. They tell us also that if we inscribe the names of the sun and moon upon the stone, and then wear it suspended from the neck, with some hair of ionosyphilis and feathers of the swallow, it will act as a preservative against all noxious spells. It is said, too, that worn in any manner this stone will ensure access to the presence of kings, and that it will avert hail and the attack of locusts, if a certain prayer is also repeated, which they mention. They make similar promises, too, in reference to the smaragdus, if graven with the figure of an eagle or of a scarabaeus, statements which, in my opinion, they cannot have committed to writing without a feeling of contempt and derision for the rest of mankind. Chapter 41. Hyacinthus. Very different from this stone is hyacinthus, though partaking of a color that closely borders upon it. The great difference between them is that the brilliant violet, which is so refulgent in the amethystus, is diluted in the other stone. Though pleasing at first sight, its beauty fades before the eye is satiated. Indeed, so far is it from satisfying the sight that it almost wholly fails to attract the eye, its luster disappearing more rapidly than the tints of the flower known by the same name. Chapter 42. Chrysolithos. Seven varieties of it. Ethiopia, which produces hyacinthos, produces chrysolithos also a transparent stone with a refulgence like that of gold. The stones of India are the most highly esteemed, as also those found among the Tiberini, provided these last are not of a mottled hue. The worst in quality are those of Arabia, the color of them being turbid and mottled, and their brilliancy interrupted by cloudy spots. Even, too, when they happen to be limpid, they have all the appearance of being full, as it were, of a peculiar dust. The best stones are those which, when placed by the side of gold, impart to it a sort of whitish hue, and so give it the appearance of silver. When this is the case, they are set in a bezel that is open on either side, but when the stone is of inferior quality, a ground of aracoliclum is placed beneath. Chapter 43. Chrysolectrum. Though it has now altogether gone out of use for jewelry, there is a precious stone known as chrysolectrum, the color of which inclines to that of amber, but only when viewed by a morning light. The stones of Pontus are known by their lightness. Some of them are hard and reddish, while others again are soft and of a soiled appearance. 
According to Bacchus, these stones are found in Spain as well, in a spot where, according to him, fossil crystal has been discovered in sinking to the water level for wells. He tells us also that he once saw chrysolithus 12 pounds in weight. Chapter 4, Leucochrysos. Four varieties of it. There's also a stone known as a leucochrysos with a white vein running across it. To this class, too, belongs Copneus, a stone also which resembles glass in appearance, and another which reflects a tint like that of saffron. These stones are imitated in glass to such a degree of perfection that it is impossible to distinguish them by the eye. The touch, however, detects the difference, the imitation being not so cold as the real stone. Chapter 45, Melichrysis, Xuthon. To this class also belongs Melichrysis, a stone which has all the appearance of pure honey seen through transparent gold. India produces these stones, and although hard, they are very brittle, but not unpleasing to the sight. The same country, too, produces Xuthon, a stone much used by the lower classes there. Chapter 46, Peaduros Saginon or Tenites. At the very head of the white stones is Piedros, though it may still be questionable to which of the colors it in reality belongs. As to the name, it has been much bandied about among other precious stones of conspicuous beauty that it has quite assumed the privilege of being a synonymous term for all that is charming to the eye. Still, however, there is one stone in particular which fully merits all the commendation that might be expected for a stone with so prepossessing a name. For in itself it reunites the transparency of crystal, the peculiar green of the sky, the deep tints of purple, and a sort of bright reflex like that of a golden-colored wine. A reflex, indeed, that is always the last to meet the eye but is always crowned with the lustrous hues of purple. The stone, in fact, has all the appearance of having been bathed in each of these tints individually and yet in the whole of them at once. There is no precious stone either that has a clearer water than this or that presents a more pleasing sweetness to the eye. Piedros of the finest quality comes from India, where it is known as Sanginan, the next best being that of Egypt, called Tanites. That of third-rate quality is found in Arabia, but it is rough upon the surface. Next, we have the stone of Pontus, the radiance of which is softer than that of Bassus, which in its turn is of a more mellowed color than the stones of Galatia, Thrace, and Cyprus. The defects commonly found in these stones are a want of brilliancy, a confusion with colors which do not properly belong to them, and the other imperfections which are found in stones in general. Chapter 47. Asteria. Next among the white stones is Asteria, a gem which holds its high rank on account of a certain peculiarity in its nature, it having a light enclosed within, in the pupil of an eye as it were. This light, which has all the appearance of moving within the stone, it transmits according to the angle of inclination at which it is held, now in one direction and now in another. When held facing the sun, it emits white rays like those of a star, and to this, in fact, it owes its name. The stones of India are very difficult to engrave, those of Carmania being preferred. Chapter 48, Astrion. Of a similar white radiance is the stone that is known as Astrion, closely resembling crystal in its nature and found in India and upon the coast of Pauline. In the center of it there shines eternally a brilliant star with a refulgence like that of the moon when full. Some will have it that the stone receives its name from the fact that when held opposite to the stars it absorbs the light they emit and then returns it. The finest stones, they say, are those of Carmania, there being none more entirely free from all defects. They add also that a stone of inferior quality is known as Saronia, and that, in the worst of all, the light is very similar to that given by a lamp. Chapter 49. Astriotis. 
Astriotis, too, is a stone that is highly esteemed, and Zoroaster, they say, has sung its wondrous praises as an adjunct of the magic art. Chapter 50. Astrobolos. Sudin says that Astrobolos resembles the eye of a fish in appearance, and that it has a radiant white refulgence when viewed in the sun. End of section 37. Section 38 of the Natural History, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Rutger, September 9, 2021, Western Massachusetts. The Natural History, Volume 7 by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 38. Book 37, Chapters 51 to 62. Chapter 51, Serania, Four Varieties of It. Among the white stones also, there is one known as Serania, which absorbs the brilliancy of the stars. It is of crystalline formation of a lustrous azure color, and is a native of Carmania. Xenothemus admits that it is white, but asserts that it has a figure of a blazing star within. Some of them, he says, are dull, in which case it is the custom to steep them for some days in a mixture of nitre and vinegar, at the end of which period the star makes its appearance, but gradually dies away by the end of as many months. Sotakis mentions also two other varieties of Serania one black and the other red, and he says that they resemble axes in shape. Those which are black and round, he says, are looked upon as sacred, and by their assistance cities and fleets are attacked and taken. The name given to them is Baetili, those of an elongated form being known as Serane. They make out also that there is another kind, rarely to be met with, and much in request for the practices of magic, it never being found in any place but one that has been struck by lightning. Chapter 52, Iris, two varieties of it. The next name mentioned by these authors is that of the stone called Iris, which is found in a fossil state in a certain island of the Red Sea, 40 miles distant from the city of Berenice. It is partly composed of crystal, and hence it is that some have called it root of crystal. It takes its name, Iris, from the properties which it possesses, for when struck by the rays of the sun in a covered spot, it projects upon the nearest wall the form of diversified colors of the rainbow, continually changing its tints and exciting admiration by the great variety of colors which it presents. That it is hexahedral in form, like crystal, is generally agreed, but some say that it is rough on the sides and of unequal angles, and that when exposed to a full sun, it disperses the rays that are thrown upon it, while at the same time, by throwing out a certain brightness before it, it illumines all objects that may happen to be adjacent. The stone, however, as already stated, only presents these colors when under cover, not as though they were in the body of the stone itself, but to all appearances as if they were a result of the reflected light upon the surface of the wall. The best kind is the one that produces the largest aris, with the closest resemblance to the rainbow. Iritis is the name of another stone, similar to the last in all of the respects, but remarkable for its extreme hardness. Horace says in his writings that this stone calcined and titrated is a remedy for the bite of the echinumen, and that it is a native of Persia. Chapter 53, Laris. The stone called Laris is similar in appearance, but does not produce the same effects. It is a crystal with streaks of white and black running across it. Chapter 54, Ake, the several varieties of it, Acapas, the remedies derived from it, Alabastritis, the remedies derived from it, Alectoria, Androdamus, Argyrodamus, Antipathies, Arabica, Aromatitis, Asbestus, Aspisatis, Atizo, Argetis, Amphidanes or Chrysolicola, Aphrodisiaca, Apisticus, 
Apsictus Egyptilia. Having now described the principal precious stones, classified according to their respective colors, I shall proceed to mention the rest of them in their alphabetical order. Achates was a stone formerly in high esteem, but now held in none. It was first found in Sicily, near a river of that name, but has since been discovered in numerous other localities. In size it exceeds any other stones of this class, and the varieties of it are numerous, the name varying accordingly. Thus, for example, we have Iaspacate, Suracates, Smaragdacates, Hemacates, Leucacates, Dendracates, marked with the small shrubs, as it were, Anticates, which when burnt has a smell like that of myrrh, and Corolacates, spotted all over like Sephiros, with drops of gold, and commonly found in Crete, where it is also known as sacred Achates. This last, it is thought, is good for wounds inflicted by spiders and scorpions, a property which I could really believe to belong to the stones of Sicily, for the moment they breathe the air of the province, scorpions lose their venom. The stones, too, that are found in India are possessed of similar properties, and of other great and marvelous properties as well, for they present the appearance in them of rivers, woods, beasts of burden, and forms even like ivy and the trappings of horses. Medical men, too, make grinding homes of these stones, and indeed the very sight of them is beneficial for the eyes held in the mouth they allay thirst. Those found in Phrygia have no green in them, and those of Thebes in Egypt are destitute of red and white veins. These last are good as counterpoison to the venom of the scorpion, and the stones of Cyprus are held in similar repute. Some persons set the highest value upon these stones, which present a transparency like that of glass, in this vicinity of Mount Eta, upon Mount Parnassus, in the Isle of Lesbos, in Messene, where they resemble the flowers that grow in the hedges and at roads. The magicians make other distinctions in reference to these stones, those, they tell us, which have spots upon them like the spots on the lion's skin, are efficacious as protection against scorpions, and in Persia, they say, these stones are used by way of fumigation for arresting tempests and hurricanes and for stopping the course of rivers. The proof of their efficacy being their turning the water cold if thrown into a boiling cauldron. To be duly efficacious, they must be attached to the body with hairs from the lion's mane. The hair, however, of the hyena is held in abomination for this purpose as being a promoter of discord in families. The stone that is of an uniform color renders athletes invincible, they say. The way of testing it is to throw it, along with the coloring matter, into a pot full of oil, after being kept for a couple hours gently on the boil. If genuine, it will impart a uniform color of vermilion to the mixture. Aepos is a stone like nitre in appearance, porous and starred with drops of gold. Gently boiled with oil and applied as an ungent, it relieves lassitude, if we choose to believe it. Alabastritus is a stone which comes from alabastron in Egypt and Damascus in Syria. It is of a white color spotted with various other tints. Cleaned with fossil salt and pulverized, it is a cure for affections of the mouth and teeth, it is said. Electoria is the name given to a stone that is found in the crop of poultry, like crystal in appearance and about as large as a bean in size. Milo of Crotona, some will have it, was thought to be in the habit of carrying this stone about him, a thing that rendered him invincible in his athletic contests. Andrew Damas has the shining color of silver, like Adamas. It is always quadrangular, like small cubes in shape. The magicians are of the opinion that it was thus named from the fact that it subdues anger and violence in man. Whether Argyrodamus is the same stone or not, authors do not inform us. Antipathis is a black stone and not transparent. The mode of testing it is by boiling it in milk, to which, if genuine, it imparts a color like that of myrrh. 
A person might probably expect to find some extraordinary virtues in the stone, seeing that among so many other substances possessed of antithetic properties, it is the only one that bears this name. The magicians will have it that it possesses the power of counteracting fascinations. Arabica is a stone which closely resembles ivory in appearance, and indeed might easily be taken for it, were it not for its superior hardness. Persons who have this stone about them, it is thought, will experience a cure of diseases of the sinews. Aromatitis, too, is a stone that is found in Arabia, as also in the vicinity of Pire in Egypt. It is always full of small stones, and, like myrrh in color and smell, a thing that makes it much in request with ladies of rank. Asbestos is found in the mountains of Arcadia and is of an iron color. Democritus informs us that Aspisatus is a native of Arabia, that it is of a fiery color, and that patients should wear it attached to the body with camel's dung. He says, too, that it is found in the nests of certain birds in Arabia. Same writer also mentions another stone of this name that is found in Lucupatera, in the same country, of a silver color, radiant, and an excellent preservative against delirium. In India, he says, and on Mount Aksidane in Persia, there is a stone found that is known as Atizo, of a silver luster, three fingers in length, like a lentil in shape, possessed of a pleasant smell, and considered necessary by the Magi at the consecration of a king. Ajetis is thought by many to be identical with Kalena. Amphidanes, which is also known as chrysocolla, is a stone found in that part of India where the ants throw up gold, and in it there are certain square pieces, like gold in appearance. The nature of this stone, it is asserted, is similar to that of the magnet, in addition to which it is said to have the property of increasing gold. Aphrodisia is a stone of a reddish-white color. Apsictus, when heated by the fire, retains the warmth so long as seven days. It is black and ponderous and is streaked with red veins. It is good, too, it is thought, as a preservative against cold. According to Aeacus, Aegyptilia is a kind of white and black sarda intersected with veins, but the stone commonly known by that name is black at the lower part and azure on the surface. It takes its name from the country that produces it. Chapter 55. Balanites, Batrachitis, Baptis, Belioculus, Bellus, Baroptinus, or Barup, Botrytis, Bostricitis, Bucadia, Brontia, Bolos. Of Balanites, there are two kinds, the one of a greenish hue and the other like Corinthian bronze in appearance. The former comes from Coptus and the latter from Troglodicta. They are both of them intersected by a flame-like vein, which runs through the middle. Coptus, too, sends us Bactrachitis, one kind of which is like a frog in color. Another has the tint of ebony, and a third is blackish, inclining to red. Batis is a soft stone and of a most excellent smell. Belioculus is a stone of a whitish hue surrounding a black pupil in the middle, which shines amid a luster like that of gold. This stone, in consequence of its singular beauty, has been consecrated to the deity held in the highest veneration by the people of Assyria. According to Democritus, there is also a stone called Belus and found in Arbella. It is about the size of a walnut and looks like glass. Baroptinus, or Baripe, is black and covered with knots of white and blood-red color. The use of it as an amulet is avoided, as being apt to produce monstrosities. Botryitis is sometimes black and sometimes purple-red, and resembles a bunch of grapes in form when making its first appearance. Zoroaster says that Bostrachitis is a stone which is more like the hair of females than anything else. Bucardia resembles an ox heart in appearance and is only found in Babylon. Brontia is a stone like the head of a tortoise, which falls with thunder, it is supposed. 
If, too, we are to believe what is said, it has the property of quenching the fire in objects that have been struck by lightning. Bolos is the name of a stone found in Iberia, similar to a clod of earth in appearance. Chapter 56. Cadmitis, Calais, Capnitis, Cappadocia, Caleca, Catochitis, Catopritis, Septitis, or Sepolatitis, Ceramitis, Cenadia, Ceritis, Circos, Corsoides, Coraloace, Corallis, Crateritis, Crocalis, Saitis, Calocophonos, Chelidonia, Chelionia, Chelonitis, Chloritis, Coaspitis, Chrysolampis, Chrysopis, Seponides. Cognitus differs only from the stone that is known as Austracitus in being sometimes surrounded with blisters of an azure color. Calais is like sapphiros in color, only that it is paler and more closely resembles the tint of the water near the seashore in appearance. Capnitis, in the opinion of some, is a peculiar species of stone. It is covered with numerous spiral streaks of a smoky color as already stated in the appropriate place. Cappadocia is a native of Phrygia and resembles ivory in appearance. Caleca is the name given to a stone like a clouded kalina. A number of them are always found united, it is said. Catochitis is a stone found in Corsia, of larger size than the other precious stones, and of a more wonderful nature, if the story is true, that it retains the hand like gum when placed upon it. Capotritis is found in Cappadocia, and from its whiteness reflects figures like a mirror. Sepitis, or Sepolatitis, is a white stone with veins upon it uniting together. Ceramitis has a color like that of earthenware. Cenadia is a stone found in the brain of a fish of a corresponding nature. It is white and oblong and possessed of marvelous virtues if we are to put faith in what is said that it announces beforehand whether the sea will be tranquil or stormy. Ceritis is a stone like wax. Circos resembles the plumage of a hawk. Corosoides is like white hair in appearance. Coraloacates is very similar to coral, marked with drops of gold, and Corallus, a native of India and Syene, resembles minium in appearance. Craterritis is in color a medium between chrysolithus and amber and is remarkable for its hardness. Cocalus is a gem like the cherry in its tints. Saitis is a stone found in the vicinity of Coptos. It is white and to all appearances has an embryo stone within, the rattling of which may be heard on shaking it. Chalcophonos is a black stone, but when struck it clinks like brass. Tragic actors are recommended to carry it about them. Of Chelidonia there are two varieties, both resembling the swallow in color. One of them is purple on one side and the other is purple besprinkled with black spots. Chelonia is the eye of the Indian tortoise and is the most marvelous of all the stones if we believe the lying stories told by the magicians. For according to them, this stone placed upon the tongue after rinsing the mouth with honey will ensure power of divination if this is done at full moon or new moon for one whole day. If however this plan is adopted while the moon is on the increase, the power of divination will be acquired before sunrise only, and if upon other days from the first hour to the sixth. Chelonitis, too, is a stone that resembles the tortoise in appearance, and many virtues of which are talked of for calming storms and tempests. As to the one that has all the appearance of being sprinkled with spots of gold, if thrown with a scarabaeus into boiling water, it will raise a tempest, they say. Chloritis is a stone of grass-green color. According to the magicians, it is found in the crop of the motacilla, being engendered with the bird. They recommend that it should be set in iron for the purpose of working certain potentious marvels, which they promise as usual. Quaspitis is a stone so called from the river Quaspus, of a brilliant golden color mixed with green. 
Chrysolampus is a native of Ethiopia and is pale by day, but of a fiery luster at night. Chrysolampus has all the appearance of gold. Seponides is found at Atarna, a borough and once a city of Aeolus. It is transparent, presents numerous tints, and has sometimes the appearance of glass, sometimes of crystal, and sometimes of iaspis. Indeed, the stones of this kind, that are tarnished even, are possessed of such singular brilliancy as to reflect objects like a mirror. Chapter 57. Daphnia Diadochus Diphes Dionysius Draconitus Daphnia is mentioned by Zoroaster as curative of epilepsy. Diadochus is a stone that resembles the barrel. Of defies, there are two kinds, the white and the black, male and female, with a line dividing the characteristics of either sex. Dionysius is hard and black and covered with red spots. Titrated in water, this stone imparts to it the flavor of wine, and it is generally thought to be a preservative against intoxication. Draconitis, or Dracontia, is a stone produced from the brain of the dragon, but unless the head of the animal is cut off while it is alive, the stone will not assume the form of a gem through spite on the part of the serpent when finding itself at the point of death. Hence it is that, for this purpose, the head is cut off when it is asleep. Sotakis, who tells us that he once saw a stone of this kind in the possession of a king, says that persons go in search of it in a chariot drawn by two horses, and that the moment they see the serpent, they strew narcotic drugs in its way, and then cut off its head when asleep. According to him, this stone is white and pellucid, and admits of no polishing or engraving. Chapter 58. Encardia, or Ariste, Anorchis. Exebinus, Eritalis, Erotylos, Amphicomos, or Hieromnemon, Eumechus, Eumithris, Eupetalos, Ureos, Eurotias, Eusebes, Epimolus. The stone Anerdia is also called Ariste. There are three varieties of it, one of a black color, with a figure in relief upon it like a heart a second of a green color, and like a heart in shape, and a third with a black heart upon it, the rest of the stone being white. An orahis is a white stone, the fragments of which, when it is split asunder, resemble the testes in shape. Xebenis, Zoroaster tells us, is a white handsome stone employed by goldsmiths for polishing gold. Erythalis, though a white stone, assumes a red hue when viewed at an inclined angle. Erotilus, also known as Amphicomos and Hieromnemon, is highly praised by Democritus for its use in the art of divination. Eumis is a stone of Biatriana. Like Silex in appearance, placed beneath the head, it produces visions in the night of an oracular description. Eumithris is called by the Assyrians Gem of Belus, the most sacred of all their gods. It is of a leek green color and greatly in request for superstitious purposes. Epitalus is a stone that has four different tints, azure fiery, vermilion, and apple color. Ureos is similar to an olive stone in form, streaked like a shell, and moderately white. Eurotius has all the appearance of concealing its black color beneath a coat of mold. Eusebius is the stone, it is said, of which the seat was made in the temple of Hercules at Tyrus, from which the pious only could raise themselves without difficulty. Epimolus is a white gem, with a black hue reflected from its surface. Chapter 59. Galaxius Galactitis Lugogia Lucographites or Cinephites Galatia Gassanade, Glossopetra, Gorgonia, Gonlia. Galaxius, by some, is called Galactitis, is a stone that closely resembles those next mentioned, but it is interspersed with veins of blood red or white. Galactitis is of the uniform color of milk. Other names given to it are Luaguaya, Luaguagraphitis, 
Luographitis and Cynophytis, and when pounded in water, both in taste and color, it marvelously resembles milk. This stone promotes the secretion of the milk in nursing women, it is said, in addition to which, attached to the neck of infants, it produces saliva, and it dissolves when put into the mouth. They say, too, that it deprives a person of their memory. It is in the river Nilus and Achelos that it is produced. Some persons give the name of Galactitis to a smaragdus surrounded with veins of white. Galea is a stone like Agirodamus, but of a somewhat more soiled appearance. These stones are found in twos and threes clustered together. The people of Medea send us glossinade, a stone like Oribus in color and sprinkled with flowers as it were. It is found at Arabella. This stone too, Aeonivis, it is said, a fact which it admits when shaken. The conception lasting for a period of three months. Glossopetra, which resembles the human tongue, is not engendered, it is said, in the earth, but falls from the heavens during the moon's eclipse. It is considered highly necessary for the purposes of Selenomani. To render all this, however, still more incredible, we have the evident untruthfulness of one assertion made about it, that it has the property of silencing the winds. Gorgonia is nothing but a coral, which has been thus named from the circumstance that, though soft in the sea, it afterwards assumes the hardness of stone. It has the property of counteracting fascinations, it is said. Gonea, it is asserted, and with the same degree of untruthfulness, ensures vengeance upon our enemies. Chapter 60. Heliotropium, Hephaestasis, Hermilandion, Hexacontolithus, Hyracites, Hamitis, Hamonis Cornu, Hormision, Hyena, Hematitis. Heliotropion is found in Ethiopia, Africa, and Cyprus. It is of a leek green color, streaked with blood red veins. It has been thus named from the circumstance that, if placed in a vessel of water and exposed to the full light of the sun, it changes to a reflected color like that of blood. This being the case with the stone of Ethiopia more particularly. Out of the water, too, it reflects the figure of the sun like a mirror and it discovers eclipses of that luminary by showing the moon passing over its disk. In the use of this stone also, we have a most glaring illustration of the impudent effrontery of the adepts in magic, for they say that, if it is combined with the plant heliotropium, and certain incantations are then repeated over it, it will render the person invisible who carries it about him. Hephaestus, also, though a radiant stone, partakes of the properties of a mirror in reflecting objects. The mode of testing it is to put it into boiling water, which should immediately become cold. If exposed to the rays of the sun, it should instantly cause dry fuel to ignite. Coricus is the place where it is found. Hermann Duane is so-called from the resemblance to the male organs which it presents on a ground that it is sometimes white, sometimes black, and sometimes of a pallid hue, with a circle surrounding it of a golden color. Hexacontolithus receives its name from the numerous variety of colors which, small as it is, it presents. It is found in Trogolodita. Hyracetus is entirely covered with mottled streaks resembling a kite's feathers, alternately with black. Hemitis is similar in appearance to the spawn of fish. There is also one variety of it which has all the appearance of being composed of nitre, except that it is remarkably hard. Hemonis cornu is reckoned among the most sacred gems of Ethiopia. It is of a golden color, like a ram's horn in shape, and ensures prophetic dreams, it is said. Hermisian is one of the most pleasing stones to the sight. It is of a fiery color and emits rays like gold, tipped at the extremity with a whitish light. Hyena is derived from the eyes of the hyena, it is said, the animal being hunted to obtain it. 
placed beneath the tongue, if we believe the story, it will enable a person to prophesy the future. Hamatitis, of the very finest quality, comes from Ethiopia, but it is found in Arabia and Africa as well. It is a stone of a blood-red color, and we must not omit to mention the assurance given by the magicians that the possession of it reveals treacherous designs on the part of the barbarians. Zacalius of Babylon, in the books which he dedicated to King Mithridates, attributing the destinies of man to certain properties innate in precious stones, is not content with vaunting the merits of this stone as curative of diseases of the eyes and liver, but recommends it also as ensuring success to petitions addressed to kings. He also makes it play its part in lawsuits and judgments and even goes so far to say that it is highly beneficial to be rubbed with on the field of battle. There is another stone of the same class called Menu by the people of India and Xanthos by the Greeks. It is of a whitish tawny color. Chapter 61 Idei, Dactyli, Ectarius, Jovis Gemma, Indica, Ion the stones called Idea Dactyli and found in Crete are of an iron color and resemble the human thumb in shape. The color of the Ieterius resembles that of livid skin, and hence it is that it has been thought so excellent a remedy for jaundice. There is also another stone of this name of a still more livid color, while a third has all the appearance of a leaf. This last is broader than the others almost imponderous and streaked with livid veins. A fourth kind again is of the same color but blacker and marked all over with livid veins. Jovis Gemma is a white stone, very light and soft. Another name given to it is Drosolithos. Indica retains the name of the country that produces it. It is a stone of a reddish color and yields a purple liquid when rubbed. There is another stone, also of this name, white, and of dusty appearance. Ion is an Indian stone, of a violet tint. It is but rarely, however, that it is found of a deep, full color. Chapter 62 Lepidotus, Lesbius, Leucophthalmos, Leucoposilos, Libanochus, Limoniatus, Laparia, Lysimachos, Leucochrysos. Lepidotis is a stone of various colors and resembles the scales of fish in appearance. Lesbius, so-called from Lesbos, which produces it, is a stone found in India as well. Leucophthalmos, which in other respects is of a reddish hue, presents all the appearance of an eye in white and black. Leucophthalmos is white, variegated with drop of vermilion of a golden hue. Libanachris strongly resembles frankincense and yields a liquid like honey. Limoniatis would appear to be the same as smaragdus, and all that we find said about liparia is that employed in the form of a fumigation, it allures all kinds of wild beasts. Lysimachos resembles Rhodian marble with veins of gold. In polishing it, it is reduced very considerably in size in order to remove all defects. Leucochrysos is a kind of chrysothelos interspersed with white. End of section 38. Section 39 of The Natural History, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Rucker, September 9, 2021, Westford, Massachusetts. The Natural History, Volume 7, by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley, Section 39, Book 37, Chapters 63 through 77. Chapter 63, Memnonia. Media, Meconitis, Mithrax, Mothrochos, Mormorian or Promnian, Meritus, Mermesius, Mersinitis, Mesoleucos, Mesomelus. 
What kind of stone Memnonia is, we do not find mentioned. Medea is a black stone, said to have been discovered by the Medea of fable. It has veins of a golden luster, and yields a liquid like saffron in color, and with a vinous flavor. Meconitis strongly resembles poppies. Mithrax comes from Persia and the mountains of the Red Sea. It is of numerous colors and reflects various tints when exposed to the sun. Morochthos is a stone of leek green color from which a milk exudes. Mormorian is a transparent stone from India of a deep black color and known also as Promnian. When it has a mixture of the color of the carbunculus, it is from Alexandria, and when it shares that of Sarda, it is a native of Cyprus. It is found also at Tyrus and in Galatia, and according to Xenocrates, it has been discovered at the foot of the Alps. These stones are well adapted for cutting in relief. Meridus has just the color of myrrh and very little of the appearance of the gem. It has the odor also of ungent and smells like nard when rubbed. Myrmiceus is black and has excrescences upon it like warts. Myrcinitis has a color like that of honey and the smell of myrtle. Mesolcucos is the name given to a stone when a white line runs through the middle and when a black vein intersects any other color it is called mesomelis. Chapter 64. Nasomonitis nebritis niparine. Nasomonitis is a blood-red stone marked with black veins. Nebritis, a stone sacred to Father Liber, and has received its name from its resemblance to a nebris. There is also another stone of this kind that is black. Nipparine bears the name of a city and people of Persia and resembles the teeth of the hippopotamus. 65. Oica, Ambria, and Nosha, Onocardia, Oritis, or Sideritis, Ostracius, Ostritis, Ophicardalon, Obsian, Stone. Oica is the barbarian name given to a stone which is pleasing for its colors, black, reddish, yellow, green, and white. Ambria, by some called Nosia, falls with showers and lightning, much in the same manner as Saronia and Brontia, the properties of which it is said to possess. There is a statement also that if this stone is placed upon altars, it will prevent the offerings from being consumed. Onocardia is like Kermsberry in appearance, but nothing further is said about it. Oritis, by some called Sideritis, is a stone of globular form and proof against the action of fire. Ostracius or Ostracitis is a testaceous stone harder than Ceramitis and similar in all respects to the Achates, except that the latter has an unctuous appearance when polished. Indeed, so remarkably hard is Ostracitis that with fragments of it other gems are engraved. Ostritis receives its name from its resemblance to an oyster shell. Ophicardolon is the barbarian name for a stone of a black color, terminated by a white line on either side. Of obsidian stone, we have already spoken in the preceding book. There are gems, too, of the same name and color found not only in Ethiopia and in India, but in Somnium as well, and, in the opinion of some, upon the Spanish shores that lie towards the ocean. Chapter 66. Pancras, Pangonus, Paneros, or Panerastus, Pontica, four varieties of it, Philogenos, or Chrysitis, Phonicitis, Phoenicitis, Physitis, Perilucos, Pianitis, or Jayanis. Pancras is a stone which displays nearly every color. Panganus is no longer than the finger. The only thing that prevents it from being taken for a crystal is its greater number of angles. What kind of stone Pancras is, Metrodorus does not inform us but he gives us some lines, by no means without elegance, that were written upon this stone by Queen Tamaris and dedicated to Venus, from which we have reason to conclude 
that certain fecundating virtues were attributed to it. By some writers, it is called panerostus. Of the stone called pontica, there are numerous varieties. One is stellated and presents either blood-red spots or drops like gold, being reckoned in the number of the sacred stones. Another, in place of stars, has streaks of the same color, and a fourth presents all the appearance of mountains and valleys. Phloginos, also called Chrysistis, strongly resembles Attic ochre and is found in Egypt. Phoenicitus is a stone so called from its resemblance to a date. Physistus receives its name from its resemblance to seaweed. Perilucos is the name given to a gem in which a white color runs down from the margin of the stone to the base. Peonitis, by some called Giannis, conceives, it is said, and is good for females at the time of parturition. This stone is found in Macedonia, near the monument of Tiresias there, and has all the appearance of congealed water. Chapter 67. Solus Gemma, Sagda, Somothracia, Sauritis, Sarcitis, Selenitis, Sideritis, Sideropelisos, Spongitis, Cynodontitis, Sartitis, Syringitis. Solus Gemma is white and, like the luminary from which it takes its name, emits brilliant rays in a circular form. Sagda is found by the people of Chaldea adhering to ships and is of a leek green color. The Isle of Samothrace gives its name to a stone which it produces black and imponderous and similar to wood in appearance. Soridus is found, they say, in the belly of the green lizard cut asunder with a reed. Sarcidus is a stone like beef in appearance. Selenitis is white and transparent with a reflected color like that of honey. It has a figure within it like that of the moon and reflects the face of that luminary if what we are told is true according to its phases. Day by day, whether on the wane or whether on the increase. This stone is a native Arabia, it is thought. Sideritis is a stone like iron, the presence of which in lawsuits creates discord. Sideropeolos, which is a variety of the same stone, is a native of Ethiopia and is covered with variegated spots. Spongitis has its name from its resemblance to sponge. Cynodontitis is a stone found in the brain of the fish known as cynodus. Sirtitis it is a stone that used formerly to be found on the shores of Sirtes, though now it is found on the coast of Lucania as well. It is of a honey color with a reflected tint of saffron and contains stars like a feeble luster within. Syringitis is hollow throughout, like the space between the joints in a straw. Chapter 68 Tritrus Delirizos Delicardios, or Mok, Thracia, three varieties of it, Tephrides, Tecolithos, Trichorus, comes from Africa. It is of a black color, but yields three different liquids, black at the lower part, blood red in its middle, and of an ochre color at the top. The Lyrizos is of an ashy or russet color, but white at the lower part. Delicarios is like a heart in color and is held in high esteem by the people of Persia, in which country it is found. The name given to it by them is mule. Of Thracia, there are three varieties, a green stone, one of a more pallid color, and a third with spots like drops of blood. Tephritis is crescent-shaped, with horns like those of the new moon, but it is of an ashy color. Tecolithus has all the appearance of an olive stone. It is held in no estimation as a gem, but a solution of it will break and expel urinary calculi. Chapter 69. Venerous Creens. Mientana. Venerous Creens is the name given to a stone that is remarkably black and shining, with an appearance like red hair within. Vientana is an Italian stone found at Vie. It is black, divided by a line of white. 
Chapter 70 Zathin Zmalampis Zorniskya Zathin, according to Democritus, is a native of Medea. It is like amber in color, and if beaten up with palm wine and saffron, it will become soft like wax, yielding a very fragrant smell. Zmilampus is found in the river Euphrates. It resembles marble of Proconesus in appearance and is of sea green color within. Soranisciae is found in the river Indus. It is a stone used by magicians, it is said, but I find no further particulars relative to it. Chapter 71 Precious stones which derive their names from various parts of the human body. Hepatitis, Diatitis, Adandanephros, Daduathalmos, Adadudaxilos, Triophthalmos. There is another method of classifying stones according to the resemblance which they bear to various other objects. Thus, for example, the different parts of the body give the following names to stone. Hepatitis is so called from the liver, and statitis from its resemblance to the fat of various animals. Adadonephros, adaduathalmos, and adaduadactylos mean kidney of adad, eye of adad, and finger of adad a god of the Syrians, so-called. Triophthalmos is a stone found in conjunction with onyx, which resembles three human eyes at once. Chapter 72. Precious stones which derive their names from animals. Carcinius, Echitis, Scorpitis, Scaritis, Triglitis, Egothalmus, Hyophthalmus, Gerinitis, Hyracitis, Aetitis, Myrmesitis, Cantharius, Lycophthalmos, Taos, Timictonia. Other stones again derive their names from various animals. Carcinius is so called from the color of the sea crab, Echitis from the color of the viper, Scorpitis from either the color or the shape of the scorpion. Cerritus from the fish called Cirrus, Triglitus from the Sermolet, Egothalmus from the eye of the goat, Hypothalmus from the eye of the swine, Gerinitus from the neck of the crane, Hyracitus from the neck of the hawk, and Aetitus from the color of the white-tailed eagle. Myrmesitis presents the appearance of an ant crawling within, and Canathrius of a scarabius. Lycothalmus is a stone of four different colors. On the exterior, it is ruddy and blood red, and within it is black, surrounded with a line of white, closely resembling the eye of the wolf in every respect. Taos is a stone with colors like those of the peacock. Timictonia, I find, is the name of a stone like the asp in color. Chapter 73, Precious Stones Which Derive Their Names From Other Objects. Hemocrisos, Sencritis, Dryatis, Sicitis, Narcissitis, Chiamias, Perin, Phoenicitis, Chalazius, Peridis, Polyzonos, Astropia, Phlogitis, Anthracitis, Enchiros, Polythrix, Leontios, Pardalios, Droslithos, Melichris, Melichorus, Crosius, Palius, Spartopalius, Rhodistis, Chalcitis, Sicitis, Bostricitis, Chernitis, Anansitis, Sinochitis, Dendritis. Hemochrysos resembles sand in appearance, but sand mixed with gold. Syncritis has all the appearance of grains of millet scattered here and there. Tritisis resembles the trunks of a tree and burns like wood. Sicitis, upon a white transparent surface, has leaves of ivy running all over it. Narcissitis is distinguished by veins on the surface and has a smell like that of Narcissus. Siamias is a black stone, but when broken produces a bean to all appearance. 
Pyren is so called from its resemblance to an olive-colored stone. In some cases, it would appear to contain the backbone of a fish. Phornicitus resembles a palm date in form. Chalazius resembles a hailstone, both in form and in color. It is as hard as adamant, so much so indeed that in the fire even it retains its coolness, it is said. Pyritus, though a black stone, burns the fingers when rubbed by them. Polyzonos is a black stone traversed by numerous zones of white. Astropia has rays like flashes of lightning running across the middle on a ground of white or blue. In Phlegitis, there is, to all appearance, a flame burning within, but not reaching the surface of the stone. In Anthracitis, there are sometimes sparks, to all appearance, flying to and fro. In Hancaros, is always perfectly round, smooth, and white. But when it is shaken, a liquid is heard to move within, just like the yolk within an egg. Polythrix presents the appearance of hair upon a green surface, but it causes the hair to fall off, it is said. Leontios and Pardalios are names given to stones from their resemblance to the skin of the lion and panther. Drosolithos has received its name from its color. Melichris is a honey-colored stone, of which there are several varieties. Melichloros is a stone of two colors, partly honey-colored, partly yellow. Croceus is the name given to a stone which reflects a color like that of saffron, Polius to a stone resembling white hair in color, and Spartopolius to a stone more thinly sprinkled with white. Rhoditis is like the rose in color, Chalcitis resembles copper, and Cicitis is in color like a fig. Bostrachitis is covered with branches of a white or blood-red color upon a ground of black, and Chernitis has, on a stony surface, a figure like that of two hands grasping each other. Anancitis is used in hydromancy, they say, for summoning the gods to make their appearance, and Sinochitis for detaining the shades from below when they have appeared. If white dendritus is buried beneath a tree that is being felled, the edge of the axe will never be blunted, it is asserted. There are many other stones also, of a still more outrageously marvelous nature, to which admitted as it is that they are stones, barbarous names have been given. We have refuted, however, a quite sufficient number of these portentous lies already. Chapter 74. Precious Stones That Suddenly Make Their Appearance Kachlid. New species of precious stones are repeatedly brought into existence, and fresh ones are found all at once destitute of names. Thus, for example, there was a stone formerly discovered in the gold mines of Lampsacus, which, on account of its extraordinary beauty, was sent to King Alexander, as we learn from Theophrastus. Pochlidis, too, which are now so common, are rather artificial productions than natural. And in Arabia, there have been found vast masses of them, which are boiled, it is said, in honey for seven days and nights without intermission. By doing this, all earthly and faulty particles are removed, after which the mass, thus cleansed and purified, is adorned by the ingenuity of artists, with variegated veins and spots, and cut into such shapes as may be most to the taste of purchasers. Indeed, these articles in former times were made of so large a size that they were employed in the East as frontals for the horses of kings and as pendants for their trappings. All precious stones in general are improved in brilliancy by being boiled in honey, Corsican honey more particularly, but acrid substances are in every respect injurious to them. As to the stones which are variegated, and to which new colors are imparted by the inventive ingenuity of man, as they have no name in common use, they are usually known by that of Thysis, a name which claims for them, as it were, that admiration which we are more ready to bestow upon the works of nature. But really, these artificial stones have names without end, and I could never think of recounting the infinite series of them coined as they have been by the frivolous tendencies of the Greeks. 
Having already described the more noble gems, and indeed those of inferior quality which are found among the stones that are held in high esteem, I must content myself with knowing that I have pointed out those kinds which are the most deserving of mention. It will be as well, however, for the reader to bear in mind that according to the varying number of spots and inequalities on their surface, according to the numerous intersections of lines and their multiplied tints and shades, the names of precious stones are subject to repeated changes, the material itself for the most part remaining just the same. Chapter 75. The Various Forms of Precious Stones we will now make some observations in reference to precious stones in general, following therein the opinions that have been expressed by various authors. Stones with a level surface are preferred to those which are concave or protuberant on the face. An oblong shape is the one that is most approved of, and next to that the lenticular form, as it is called. After this, the stone with a plain surface and circular is admired those which are angular being held in the least esteem. There is considerable difficulty in distinguishing genuine stones from the false, the more so as there has been discovered a method of transforming genuine stones of one kind into false stones of another. Sardonyx, for example, is imitated by cementing together three other precious stones in such a way that no skill can detect the fraud. A black stone being used for the purpose, a white stone and one of vermilion color, each of them in its own way a stone of high repute. Nay, even more than this, there are books in existence, the authors of which I forbear to name, which give instructions how to stain crystal in such a way as to imitate smaragdus and other transparent stones, how to make sardonyx of sarda and other gems in a similar manner. Indeed, there is no kind of fraud practiced by which larger profits are made. Chapter 76. The Methods of Testing Precious Stones On the contrary, we will make it our business to point out the methods of detecting these false stones, seeing that it is only proper to put luxury even on its guard against fraud. In addition to the particulars which we have already given, when treating of each individual kind of precious stone, it is generally agreed that the transparent stones should be tested by a morning light, or even, if necessary, so late as the fourth hour, but never after that hour. The modes of testing stones are numerous, first by their weight, the genuine stone being the heavier of the two, next by their comparative coolness, the genuine stone being cooler than the other to the mouth, and next to that by their substance, there being blisters perceptible in the body of the fictitious stone, as well as a certain roughness on the surface, filaments too, an unequal brilliancy, and a brightness that falls short before it reaches the eye. The best mode of testing is to strike off a fragment with an iron saw, but this is a thing not allowed by the dealers, who equally refuse to let their gems be tested by the file. Dust of obscene stone will not leave a mark upon the surface of a genuine stone, but where the gem is artificial, every mark that is made will leave a white scratch upon it. In addition to this, there is such a vast diversity in their degrees of hardness that some stones do not admit of being engraved with iron, and others can only be cut with a graver blunted at the edge. In all cases, however, precious stones may be cut and polished by the aid of adamas an operation which may be considerably expedited by heating the graver. The rivers which produce precious stones are the Ancinus and the Ganges, and of all countries India is the most prolific of them. Chapter 77. A Comparative View of Nature as She Appears in Different Countries. The Comparative Values of Things. Having now treated all the works of nature, it will be as well to take a sort of comparative view of her several productions, as well as the countries which supply them. Throughout the whole earth, then, and wherever the vault of heaven extends, there is no country so beautiful, or which, for the productions of nature, merits so high a rank as Italy. That ruler and second parent of the world, recommended as she is by her men, her women, her generals, her soldiers, her slaves, her superiority in the arts, 
and the illustrious examples of genius which she has produced. Her situation, too, is equally in her favor. The salubrity and mildness of her climate, the easy access which she offers to all nations, her coast indented with so many harbors, the propitious breezes, too, that always prevail on her shores, advantages all of them due to her situation lying as she does midway between the east and the west and extended in the most favorable of all positions add to this the abundant supply of her waters and the salubrity of her groves the repeated intersections of her mountain ranges the comparative innocuousness of her wild animals the fertility of her soil, and the singular richness of her pastures. Whatever there is that the life of man ought not to feel in want of is nowhere to be found in greater perfection than here. The cereals, for example, wine, oil, wool, flax, tissues, and oxen. As to horses, there are none, I find, preferred to those of Italy for the course while for mines of gold, silver, copper, and iron, so long as it was deemed lawful to work them, Italy was held inferior to no country whatsoever. At the present day, teeming as she is with these treasures, she contents herself with lavishing upon us, as the whole of her bounties, her various liquids, and the numerous flavors yielded by her cereals and her fruits. Next to Italy, if we accept the fabulous regions of India, I would rank Spain, for my own part, those districts at least that lie in the vicinity of the sea. She is parched and sterile in one part, it is true, but where she is at all productive, she yields the cereals in abundance, oil, wine, horses, and metals of every kind. In all these respects, Gaul is her equal, no doubt. But Spain, on the other hand, outdoes the Gallic provinces in her spartum and her specular stone, the products of her desert tracts, in her pigments that minister to our luxuries, in the ardor displayed by her people in laborious employments, in the perfect training of her slaves, in the robustness of body of her men, and in their general resoluteness of character. As to the productions themselves, the greatest value of all among the products of the sea is attached to pearls. Of objects that lie upon the surface of the earth, it is crystals that are most highly esteemed, and of those derived from the interior, adamas, smaragdus, precious stones, and marine are the things upon which the highest value is placed. The most costly things that are matured by the earth are kermisberry and laser that are gathered from trees, nard and cere tissues that are derived from the trunks of trees, logs of citrus wood that are produced by shrubs, cinnamon, cassia, and amomum, that are yielded by the juices of trees, or of shrubs, amber, apobalsamum, myrrh, and frankincense, that are found in the roots of trees, the perfumes derived from costus. The most valuable products furnished by living animals on land are the teeth of elephants, by animals in the sea, tortoise shell, by coverings of animals, the skins which the ceres dye, and the substance gathered from the hair of the she-goats of Arabia, which we have spoken of under the name of La Danum. By creatures that are common to both land and sea, the purple of the murex. With reference to the birds beyond the plumes for warriors' helmets and the grease that is derived from the goose of Kamangin, I find no remarkable product mentioned. We must not omit, too, to observe that gold, for which there is such a mania with all mankind, hardly holds the tenth rank as an object of value, and silver, with which we purchase gold, hardly the twentieth. Hail to thee, nature, thou parent of all things, and do thou deign to show thy favor unto me, who alone of all the citizens of Rome have, in thy every department, thus made known thy praise. Summary Facts, Narratives, and Observations 1300 Roman authors quoted M. Varro, the Register of the Triumphs, Maecenas, Iacus, Cornelius Bacchus, foreign authors quoted king juba xenocrates the son of zeno sudines aeschylus philoxenus euripides 
Nicander, Satyrus, Theophrastus, Charis, Philemon, Demostratus, Xenothemus, Metrodorus, Sotacus, Pythias, Timaeus, the Sicilian, Nicias, Theocrestus, Asarubus, Nasius, Theomenus, Stisius, Mithridates, Sophocles, King Archelaus, Callistratus, Democritus, Ismenius, Olympicus, Alexander, Polyhistor, Appian, Horus, Zoroaster, Zacalius. End of section 39. End of the Natural History, Volume 7, by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley.